gradual process of evolution suggests the explanation of the controlling deities, Abhidaiva, because Varuna is the controlling deity for all relishable juices. Therefore, the mouth becomes the resting place for the tongue, which tastes all the different juices of which the controlling deity is Varuna. This suggests, therefore, that Varuna was also generated along with the development of the tongue. The tongue and the palate being instrumental at adibutam, or forms of matter, but the functioning deity who is a living entity is Adidaiva, whereas the person undergoing the function is Adi Atma. Thus, the three categories are also explained as to their birth after the opening of the mouth of the Virata Purush. The four principles mentioned in the verse serve to explain the three main principles, namely the Adi Atma, Adi Daiva, and Adi Bhuta, as explained before. Yeah, 
Sukadeva Goswami is explaining to Maharaj Parikshit about the process of creation. When he is explaining about the gradual evolution of the different sense organs and sense activities. And there's a gradual process of the development of the, the, the body of the Virata Purush. Right? The Virata Purush is the sum total of all the living entities. It means all the different living entities, all their different organs and senses, everything are all there within this one form called the Virata Purush. So there, we explained yesterday, there are five elements, basic elements, earth, water, fire, air, and ether. And these different elements uh, are connected to a particular organ of our bodies. Just like the finest element is ether. Right? So within ether there is only one uh, there is only one uh, sense object, there's only sound. And in order to detect sound, we have to have ears. We don't we cannot perceive sound with our tongue or with our skin. Sound is only perceived through the ear. And there's a controlling deity also for the ear. There's a controlling deity. Right? There's 300 there are 30, 3, 330 million deities. And each of these deities have some function over the different actions of our sense organs. Just like it's described here, that there's the deity Varuna who is responsible for the tastes. It, it is through the power of Varuna that we pers our tongue can perceive different tastes. Lord Balaram it said one of Lord Balaram's two wives, one wife is Varuni. Lord Balaram is very fond of honey. So Varuni is the controlling Varuna is the, usually we hear about Varuna that he's the god of the ocean. But here it's described how Varuna is actually responsible for the perceiving different tastes. <coughs> so sound is perceived by the ear. So and it's, sound is only there in the ether. And then the next element is air, and with air we can perceive touch. Right? When we put on the electric fans or when we turn on the air conditioning, 
we can perceive, we feel the, the, the air. Or you go outside and there's some breeze, you can feel the wind. And we can perceive also sometimes the heat of the, the how warm it is through the air. And that perception of the air, that is through the skin. And so our skin perceives the, the, the touch. And then after air, then the next element is fire. And fire will have a form. Right? You can have little candle lights, the light from the candles, a small light, but you can have a big blazing fire. So fire takes on different forms, and these forms are seen by our eyes. And there's a controlling deity for the eyes also. And then next element after fire, then we have water. And we know water has a taste. And here we're hearing about the taste, and we're told the deity in charge of the taste is his Varuna. And taste is perceived through the tongue. Right? Our skin cannot perceive the taste. And just by hearing or looking, we don't know what is the taste. We often say the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Somebody has cooked a nice cake. It may look very nice, but we have to taste it to know if it's really good or not. Just like the, the monkey came by the house and he saw there was a big plate of fruit in front of the house. He saw these big apples and the monkey thought, oh, I'm going to have a feast today. And the monkey climbed over into the garden and took one of these apples from the plate. But when he went to bite it, it was, it was like rock. Was actually a wooden apple. <laughs> and it, it, it looked just like the real apple. <laughs> the monkey had the apple and he could not eat it. <laughs> he was so attached, he was holding the apple in his hand. <laughs> but he could not taste the apple. And then he came along the road and then he saw there was a tree full of many apples. But he was thinking, no, I have an apple, I have my apple. He didn't want to let go of the, the wooden apple to get the real apple. So material life is like that. We hold on to the illusion. We want to enjoy the illusion. But to, in, in order to experience the reality, we have to let go of the illusion. And so our senses are given to us to perceive different actions. 
Right? With the with the tongue we can taste water. Lord Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Rasoham Apsukonti Ah, I am the taste in water. The active principle in everything is Lord Sri Krishna. But Lord Krishna delegates his different demigods, he gives them each some responsibility. Krishna doesn't do everything himself, he delegates the responsibility. Prabhupada delegated all the responsibilities to run the society. He didn't, Prabhupada didn't have hands on everything, controlling everything. He, he let the devotees manage. Of course, sometimes Prabhupada would point out faults, some things he didn't like. So he would tell them that he, something was not right, he would let the devotees know, he would guide them, but generally he gave the devotees that independence. And he said, you make the money, you should, you should can decide how you want to spend it. But Prabhupada didn't like to see devotees waste money. There was one devotee one time, he was in charge of the temple and Prabhupada told him, he said, you spend money like a rich man's son. Right? If your father is a rich man, then you enjoy spending your father's money. So Prabhupada told this one devotee who was running the temple, he said, you spend money like a rich man's son. In other words, Prabhupada was telling him, he said, you spend money very freely, you don't care, you don't seem to value the money. Yeah, if, if your father's a rich man, you know, you just spend his money, you know, you, do, you, do, you don't worry about weight making money, you think, my father's rich, I can spend. But if you work yourself to get money, your father had no money, and you work yourself to get money, then you value the money much more. So if you want to know the real value of money, you make it, make the money yourself, then you value it more. So anyway, Lord Krishna delegates responsibilities to the administrative demigods to oversee the affairs of the material creation. And we have Varuna in charge of the taste, which is perceived through the tongue. And then the final element is earth. And earth has the, the, the fragrance of the earth, the aroma of the earth. The original fragrance of the earth, right? And how do we perceive the aroma? By the nose. The tongue cannot perceive the, the smell. 
the eyes, the skin, they cannot know what is the smell. It is simply the nose which can perceive. And it's not just simply the nose itself, but it's the, the living force which is there within each of these sense organs. Just like a dead person, the nose is still there, but he cannot smell anything. The soul is gone, so there's no consciousness, there's no life in the body. The organs are there, the nose is there, the tongue is there, but they cannot do anything. Because the soul is gone, and that, that soul is the living force in the body. Prabhupada talks how woman may be very beautiful, but if she's dead, who wants to embrace the, the dead woman? So the beauty is not in the body, the beauty is actually in the soul. But out of illusion, people are attracted by the body. We want to understand properly what is the nature of the material body. And we know in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna describes the body to be just like a dress. Just like we give up the old dress, we will put on the new dress. In the same way we give up the old body, we take a new body. So the body is like a dress. Just as the dress does not have any consciousness, the body itself is also not conscious. But it is the soul which enters in to the body, which gives it life. And because the soul is there in the body, so the different sense organs can all function. We can perceive, smell, and taste, and form, and touch. All the different sense objects come about because the soul is there in the body. But without the soul, there is no, there is no, one cannot understand anything. So in this way we're hearing about the development, the evolution of the universal body. Mm. All right, are there any questions? Any question? Um, is this Vriyat Purusha the same as the universal body Krishna showed to Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita? Yes, well, the, the one Krishna showed to Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita, that was a special universal form. That was like Kala Rup, the form of time, where you could see all of the different soldiers that were all going to die. But 
Srila Prabhupada explains this in Vedanta Purusha. He said, This is the, the, the sum total of all living entities. Meaning, all the different living entities, they're all there, all their different. Organs and senses and bodies are all there within that form of the Vedanta Purusha. The Vedanta Purusha is the total, everything together, all the different living entities like the Brahman, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Sudra, they're all there in the universal form. And we hear like the suns, like the eyes of the universal form. And mountains and rivers are like the veins in the universal form. Mountains are like the bones in the body of the universal form. And we have the different planetary systems. The upper planets are like the top, the head of the body of the Virata Rupa. The, the top, the heavenly planets, the upper planets represent the, the top, the upper part of the body of the universal form. And the lower planetary systems like Sutala Loka, Patala Loka, Mahalo, these lower planets, they are all representing the feet and the legs of the Virata Rupa. So everything which is there in the cosmic manifestation and all living entities is all there within the Virata And we are hearing how there's a, a gradual evolution of the different senses from this Virata you can see the systematic development of the different organs. So we heard like the Krishna himself doesn't do everything, he delegates responsibility to the demigods. So I feel like a, the leader of group, should the leader delegate responsibility to the members group? Yes, that's good management. Uh, a good manager, he will, he will get, uh, he will engage everyone. Mm -hmm. If you try to do everything yourself, then you, you, you're not managing. So it, it's a good system to engage everyone in Krishna service, give everyone some responsibility. That's, that's the idea, that's why there is such a thing as management, right? Management means you engage other people, get other people, give people responsibility, let them do things. So, Lord Krishna is a, you know, he's the universal manager. There's a hierarchy, you can see in the universe, there's a hierarchy. There's administrative demigods. 
呃，所以奎斯特是宇宙的管理者，呃，在他的系统当中也有不同的等级，呃，比如说有范神人。We're thinking, we're managing, we're thinking, we're controlling, but we're all controlled. We're under the control of these different demigods. So we have to also offer our, we also offer our respects to these demigods. We understand they're also doing their service on behalf of the Supreme Lord. 呃，我们要理解他们也在为至尊主做服务。So if you're managing a group, you definitely want to be able to engage other people. 所以如果你在管理一个小组，你也应该让其他人参与进来，承担一些责任。And that way, other people will feel appreciated. They'll feel valuable. 嗯。But if if you just leave that, if you just think, oh well, you're in charge, you do it, you, then you know, then that's not that's not a, a good mood. You've got to create a team. You've got to get a team together. You've got to get people who will work together, and everyone will take some responsibility. And then, when you have a team together, then you can do things. So, Prabhupada, when he went to America, he was concerned to get people to. Immediately engage people and make them feel responsible. So, when Prabhupada came to America, his first concern was to make people feel that they were responsible. So, when Prabhupada came to America, his first concern was to make people feel that they were responsible. So, when Prabhupada came to America, his first concern was to make people feel that they were responsible. So, when Prabhupada came to America, his first concern was to make people feel that they were responsible. So, when Prabhupada came to America, his first concern was to make people feel that they were responsible. So, when Prabhupada came to America, his first concern was to make people feel that they were responsible. So, when Prabhupada came to America, his first concern was to make people feel that they were responsible. So, when Prabhupada came to They were totally new people who didn't know anything. So he came to America. He joined this organization, this group, and then let other people to take on different jobs. These people were new people, they didn't know what to do. They didn't know what to do. But Prabhupada wanted to engage them. He wanted them to feel responsible, get connected. But Prabhupada wanted them to feel responsible, get connected. But Prabhupada wanted them to feel responsible, get connected. But Prabhupada wanted them to feel responsible, get connected. Just like everything else in any other organization, they 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 will want to create that mode, that cooperation where people want to dedicate themselves to, to the to the company or to the organization. So, in Kui Shi's perception, our organization is like any other organization. We want everyone to work together to achieve something. Any other questions? So today, of course, is the disappearance day of uh, His Divine Grace, Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Goswami Prabhupada. So, uh, we'll, uh, at 11 o'clock, we'll meet here. And we'll speak about the life and the, the activities of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati. You can hear about his pastimes, how he established the Gaudiya Mat. He established the Gaudiya Mat to Spread the message of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Ah, we will hear how he established the Gaudiya Mat to spread the message of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And how he met our own founder Acharya Bhakti Vedanta Swami Prabhu. And how he met our own founder Acharya Bhakti Vedanta Swami Prabhu. And how he engaged him. 
So if you have ways, um, the number of devotees is not so many. Uh, during some festival, like some of the festivals, uh, for example, we have to make gardens for the parampara while making prasada, but because of the limitation of the number of people, can we make it more simple? Um, like, for example, not making so many gardens, less gardens, she didn't say, Completely. Well, of course, everything you have to consider everything. How much ability you have, how many people you have, how much funds you have. Uh, you know, you're up in Dong Dong Bay. If you're up in Harbin, you know, to buy flowers in the winter time, you know, it can be very expensive. I know Kavi Chandra Swami always tells me about Japan. He said in, in Japan to buy a, one flower, they're so expensive, it's just unbelievable. I remember when I joined the movement in London, you know, in London also flowers are very expensive. And so we wouldn't offer flowers, we would just offer one petal. Every devotee got a petal. So you, you have to consider everything according to time and the place and the circumstances. You know, here in Malaysia, you can just walk around and you can pick flowers off the trees everywhere, you know. Sometimes we devotees will also go, there's a mountain area, uh, Cameron Highlands, and they have a, they grow a lot of flowers there, and the devotees will go there when they have a big festival. The devotees will go there and they'll get flowers donated from the people there. But you know, if you go to Hong Kong, then nobody will give you anything. <laughs> flowers are very expensive. It's Hong Kong. There's no flowers growing anywhere. <laughs> Just buildings. <laughs> so you know, have to consider this place. What you can do. So you will have to do your own social activity. Do you want to go to the church? So you're in Nancha or somewhere? Nancha. Yeah. Not many people. So, yeah, a simple program. But what's important is the mood, the devotion. It's the mood. It's not the the flowers and fruits, but it's the mood, the devotion which is appreciated. Lord Krishna has many flowers and fruits in Goloka. 
And he has many goddesses of fortune there all serving him. So he's not anxious to get the flowers and fruits, but he, he wants the devotion. But at the same time, you know, we shouldn't think, oh, I'll just give, give devotion, I won't bother to get any flowers. <laughs> So you have to do the best you can. So you have to do the best you can. So you Understand that the, whatever power is there in Sri Prabhupada is coming by the grace of his spiritual master. Correct, Prabhupada gives the credit to his spiritual master. Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada certainly did great preaching and he was very successful when he was physically present. But the, after his departure, the, follow, the, the, the disciples did not follow all of his instructions. He had instructed them not to put any one person as the Acharya. He had instructed them to make a body and to work together and manage everything. But there were two parties, there were two sides. One, one side wanted to do things one way, the other side wanted to do another way. So they fought together, to arguments, they went to court, and court battles, they spent a lot of money in the court. Uh, they were all arguing about who should get what property. They say this temple, this land, this is for us, for our society. So they were arguing about the land and the money, but they were not thinking about the preaching. So Srila Prabhupada didn't worry about any land or property, he just put his time and energy into preaching. And in this way he was successful. So he encouraged us to also 
you know, concentrate on preaching, thinking more about preaching, distributing the message of Lord Chaitanya. Not so much worried about just having temples. So books also, Prabhupada put a lot of emphasis on book production. But the Gaudiya Mahs, after the departure of Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati, they never really published or printed many books. So Prabhupada taught, taught us this, where to get money, use it to print books. And so we print a lot of books and we try to distribute books. So that's the, these books are a very important feature of the ISKCON society. In Gaudiamat, we don't have these books. They buy our books. <laughs> Okay, Girigam, you have a question? <laughs> Today we were seeing the demigods control the cis, the cis organs. So if we have some problem with the eyes, it's because we offend the deity is controlling the eyes. Maybe. Still can <laughs> Definitely want to get the blessings of all the demigods. So how do we get the blessings of all the demigods? Just simply by worshiping Lord Krishna. If we worship Lord Krishna nicely, all the demigods will bestow their blessings. Right. Demigods are all the leaves and branches, and Lord Krishna is the root. So you, we put the water on the root, and then the whole tree is nourished. So if we're worshipping Lord Krishna nicely, all the demigods will bestow their blessings. One who is the devotee of the Lord, then they will have all the good qualities. So if we have some problem with our eyes, Maybe our worship is not the natural uh, improved by our worship. Uh, so we can see the worship. We have to use our eyes more to see the beauty of Lord Krishna. We have to use our eyes more to see the beauty of Lord Krishna. And to read the Srimad Bhagavatam. Okay. Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam.